I was thinking a lot this week about lying and I realized that we all are probably guilty of lying. Raise your hand if that's you, right? We all have, like, like maybe you don't want to admit to it at this point, but let's see if some of these lies um, come, come to the surface. Like, the check is in the mail. That's a, that's a lie that uh, we've, well, nowadays you can't really get away with that because they want you to pay everything online. Um, I'll start my diet tomorrow. That's, that's a lie that might sting a little bit more, but I'm sure you've, uh, you've committed that lie. Um, I, I told this lie this week. I said, sure, sure we can have breakfast, no problem. And then I never actually went out and, and had breakfast. Um, so we, we, we say these, these lies often, right? Um, we don't really think about it. For, for instance, you know, we service what we sell. That's another, another one of those things you understand as soon as you buy. That's going to be a, that's a lie, right? You're not going to get away with that one. Um, the reason I think we lie is, is sometimes we're trying to protect something within ourself. We're trying to protect maybe our own um, perception. We want, we want people to believe the best out of us. And unfortunately, that causes us to lie sometimes, right? Now, some, these are just simple lies, but lies can, can kind of blow out of proportion. A lie is to, to be deceptive in the way that we speak. It's to use words or, or to tell people something to mislead them. And uh, we, we all could be somewhat guilty of lying. In the Old Testament, lies could be really subtle. For instance, uh, you, you've probably heard this lie. God didn't say that you would surely die. Right. Or, or this one, uh, where Cain's talking to, his, to, to God. He says, I, I don't know where my brother's at. Am I my brother's keeper? This is like a, a, a deflection. You're, you're just trying to get the focus off of you to someone else. But then other times lies are very bold. And, and like when you got um, Jacob who dresses in goat's hair and sits on his father's lap and says, I'm Esau. I've done exactly what you've told me to do. That would be one lie that's maybe a little more bold in, in its way of understanding it. Um, also, you have Joseph, Joseph's brothers. They take his coat, the one that his father gave him, and they tear it and they dip it in blood and they bring it to, to Jacob and they say, examine it for yourself. If, see if this isn't your, your son's robe or coat. And uh, Jacob spent his, mo- the, most of the rest of his life believing a lie that his son was dead when the whole time he was in Egypt. So we, we can be really bold in our lives. Sometimes they're just a deflection. It even happens among kingdom citizens, right? Lies happen among kingdom citizens. We, we're reminded of Peter who is standing outside in, in, the, in the court saying, I never knew that man. I'm telling you the truth. I never knew that man. And then the rooster crows three times and immediately he realizes what Jesus had said and he's caught in his lie. Lies kind of work like that. They, they just, all of a sudden, you think you might be just telling a small fib. And then they pile up and pile up and pile up. Before you know it, you're buried beneath your own lies. And uh, so I've been thinking a lot about, about that. And I, I, I got to have a conversation this week with a police officer. And I, when you get a minister and a police officer together in the same room and they start to talk, they, the subjects get really deep. And so we spent over an hour talking about truth. Truth is a concept. Truth is as like, what is truth? And he, he said to me, I only, I only know truth two times where I can be absolutely sure that the person I'm talking to is telling me the truth. He said, one time is when they're on their deathbed. He said, something about death makes truth come to the surface for most people. The other time that he could be absolutely sure that somebody is telling him the truth is when they're overdosing on something. He said they usually answer the question, what did you ingest with absolute truth? Because their life is on the line, right? And when our life is on the line, maybe that's when when we we come to the most truth. But I want to point out that a lie is not simply something that comes out of our mouth, right? Right? A lie is not just the words that we say. It can be the lifestyle that we live. See, people can live a lie. Jesus would call this a hypocrite. You can live a lie. Jesus would call it a hypocrite. And Paul dealt with this problem in Romans chapter 2. He, he writes the book of Romans to both a, a Jewish and a Gentile audience. But in chapter 2, he's dealing with, with the Jewish people. And in verse 21, he says this. 
You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So why was God's name being blasphemed among the Gentiles? It's because the people were living a lie. They claimed to teach about truth, but in honesty, they were living a lie. They said, don't steal, but in truth, they were stealing. They said, don't commit adultery, but in truth, they were committing adultery. They said they loved and valued the law, but in truth, they broke the law. So that's the problem with people who live a lie, is you can't really figure out what truth is when you're dealing with those people. Because their life is wrapped up in it. And Jesus, when he's on the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5 of Matthew, in verse 20, and you guys can open up your Bible, that's where we're spending our time, is in Matthew chapter 5. In, in verse 20, Jesus says, Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about this idea that the righteousness that allows us to stand before God is not our own righteousness. We seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be given to us. The righteousness that allows us to stand before God is God's righteousness, Christ's righteousness, given to us by His act on the cross. And that righteousness is, is allowed to us because we approach Him as if we're poor in spirit, as if we're mourning over our sins. Right? That's the righteousness that allows us to stand before God. But in, Romans, or in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he's talking about the way in which we live our life because righteousness means to be in good standing. And he's saying that you should live your life in a way that is in good standing with God, so much so that it's undivided, that it surpasses that of the Pharisees. The problem with the Pharisees is they may have taught that you shouldn't steal, but they stole. They may have taught that you should love the law, but they didn't honor the law. Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs because they're beautiful on the outside, but inside they're full of dead man's bones. See, they were divided. I want you to see that. They, they were one thing on the outside and a different thing on the inside. And Jesus is calling us to a righteousness that surpasses that, a righteousness that's undivided complete. That's what we should be striving for, a righteousness that is undivided and complete. And Jesus shows us in Matthew chapter 5 what an undivided and complete righteousness looks like. He talks about murder and says that it begins with our thoughts. If anybody's angry at their brother, moves on to our words, right? Don't call your brother raka or fool. And then goes on to our actions. So a righteousness that surpasses that, that of the Pharisees, as we discussed last week, begins with our thoughts, is seen in our, heard in our words, and is seen in our actions. He goes on to talk about adultery and says it's not the act of adultery itself that's the problem, it's the lust that led to the adultery. So adultery needs to be, be, be something that we protect ourselves from beginning at that lust, because kingdom righteousness begins in the heart, and the heart needs to be protected above all things. And I want you to know you protect your heart with your mind, not your mind with your heart. Our heart is desperately wicked. We protect our heart with our mind. And so Jesus says that we should go to the most extreme. He uses a hyperbolic speech and talks about plucking out your eye and, and, and cutting off your hand. But what he's really saying is protect your heart at all costs from lust. Because kingdom righteousness begins in the mouth, is heard in our words, is seen as our, in our actions. And it be, it's right there inside of your heart and must be protected there. And then Jesus goes on to talk about divorce. And, and we talked about kingdom righteousness is a, a righteousness that values what God values. God values marriage, and we should value marriage too. Those were the first three of the six sections that Jesus is talking about when he says a, we should have a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. Those are the first three of the six sections that he discusses. And today we're going to hit the last three and then answer my one question. The first, question, the, first, the first point I want to make is that kingdom righteousness involves personal integrity. 
kingdom righteousness. And the reason it says verse four, or point number four is because we started this sermon last week, right? We've hit murder, we've hit adultery, we've hit divorce, and now we're talking about oaths. And so kingdom righteousness involves personal integrity. And let's look at what Jesus says here. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to people long ago. If you guys are reading along, this is in verse 33 of Matthew chapter 5. Again, you've heard it said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill them to the Lord, the vows that you have made. Right? This is Jesus beginning his statement by telling us a law or a common understanding of the law. And then he elevates this law up with the words, but I tell you. And so he goes on to say in verse 34, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. So here's what, like, this is about integrity. The, the people of Is, the Israelites, the Jewish people, would swear oaths in order to prove that they were speaking truth. And Jesus is saying you shouldn't have to, to use an oath in order to prove that you're speaking truth. Truth should be part of our character. Truth should be part of what it is to be, have a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. It's about being honest. It's about being a person of integrity. It's about being pure of heart. Right? Now, what, what we find is that throughout the Old Testament, people swore oaths. We remember Abraham had his servant put his hand on his thigh and, and promised that he was going to go find a wife for his son Isaac in a, in his, his homeland. There was an oath, a pledge. We have Jacob and Laban, and, and they, they built up a pile of, of stones so that they can say this is a testament to the treaty that we made. They, they had that as, a, as a proving their, their words. Even God is said to have made an, a, a, an oath. On, he didn't have anyone greater than himself to say it on, so he said it on himself. Right? So oaths were part of that old covenant. But by the time Jesus steps on here and by the time he's standing on the mountain that he's preaching from, oaths had been degraded to the point where they really meant nothing. And we can find this in Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus talks about this. In chapter 23, um, verse 16, he says this, and he's talking to the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold in the temple, he is bound to that oath. You blind fools. Which is easier? Which is easier? Which is greater? The gold of the temple that makes the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? That's the problem. They, they began to say, well, you know, we could get away with some kind of manipulation here. If we swear by the, the temple, that means nothing. If, but if we swear by the gold in the temple, that means something, right? So instead, what was happening is these people, these Pharisees were beginning to use oaths and uh, they were beginning to manipulate them so that they could lie through them, right? They were using oaths and pledges as a way to manipulate people. And Jesus says it shouldn't be that way with kingdom righteousness. Kingdom righteousness is that about integrity. We should practice being pure of heart. We should be honest in front of people. And so Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. And this is in verse 34 of Matthew chapter 5. Either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. What Jesus does is he, he raises the standard of righteousness for kingdom citizens so that every word we say is on the level of a holy oath. That's the kind of righteousness that we have. We should be people of integrity so that everybody knows that we are truthful. Our yeses mean yes and our noes mean no. And that's about as far as it goes. Because kingdom righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees is honest. It's about that of integrity. Jesus goes on, and this is my second point. Kingdom righteousness that, that surpasses that of the Pharisees is about self-denial. 
A righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees is about self-denial. And listen to what Jesus says in verse 38 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, I was thinking about this this week, and just raise your hand if you're right-handed. Who in here is right-handed? Most everyone's right-handed, right? So if two right-handed people stand in front of each other, and the right-handed person slaps the other person on the cheek, what cheek are they getting? The left. Unless they backhand the person, right? And so what we're really finding out is that, that this is a backhanded thing. Right? If somebody backhands you, somebody slaps you on, on your right cheek, go ahead and turn to them your left. Right? This idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth is, is about justice. We often think of it as being really harsh, but it's a lot also about mercy too. Right? Because what this law prohibited was somebody who was seeking justice from getting vengeance. That's what comes easier, I think, for me is, is I, I don't always want justice. I want, I want vengeance. Like when I'm, when I'm at home and, and like I'm talking to my kids, I, I don't want to just like make them feel bad. I want to make them feel terrible, right? That's me. Like I don't want to just win a fight. I want, I want to destroy you, right? But Jesus comes along and says, no, it's not about an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. It's about, it's about self-denial. Right? An eye for an eye is about getting justice. And maybe we look forward to the day that we get justice, right? But justice is for God to deliver. When we're living in this world, it's about self-denial because our king lived a life about self-denial. He denied himself and took up the cross. We're told to do the same, right? He humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. We're, we're told to take on that same nature, right? And so we should also be people about self-denial. And that's why Jesus says, don't even resist an evil person. If somebody slaps you on your right cheek, turn, them, turn to them and give them your left. If someone, he has another, another example. He says um, in verse 40, and if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand them over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go with them two miles. Now, I was thinking about this, like, why would somebody force them to go a mile? But the Roman people had a, a, a law that said, if you were a Roman soldier, you could demand that people who weren't Roman citizens carry your stuff up to a mile, right? So that we get the picture of Simon helping Jesus carry the cross because somebody said, hey, help, help Jesus out. And he had to do it. That's the, that's the culture that they were living in. If a Roman soldier said, hey, carry my sword, you had to carry his sword. But Jesus is saying, don't carry his sword just one mile. Take it two. Right? That's, that's, that's not just doing what, what you, getting what you deserve. That's about, that's about self-denial. I'll give of myself because my king gives of himself. He doesn't expect... One day there will be justice, but today there's self-denial. And it happens even when somebody wants to borrow. In verse uh, 42, it says, Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Right? This whole idea, this standard of righteousness that Jesus is lifting us up to say that kingdom righteousness is about self-denial means that we put other people first, above our own self. And that's what Jesus did. If you want a model of self-denial, look at your Savior. He is the example of what it means to deny yourself. And that's the standard of righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. The next one, I think, kind of sums up all six. And it's that kingdom righteousness reflects the love of our Father. Kingdom righteousness reflects the love of our Father. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 43. If you have your Bible, you can read it. It says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. Right? I just want to point out that there's no scripture in the Old Testament where you're going to find where it says, love your neighbors and hate your enemy, right? This is what would happen is, is the Jewish people began to derive their, some of their own laws, taking this idea from here and that idea from there and smashing them together. And you take two verses out of context and what do you got? 
a pretext for whatever you want to make it. And so they had found a way to justify hate. Love your neighbors and hate your enemies. They took verses like Psalm 5, 5, where it talks about God's hatred. And they said, well, if God does this, we can do it too. Right? We're just not, not quite so good at it. But they had this practice that they loved their neighbors and hated their enemies. They were even confused on who their neighbor was. So Jesus has to set them straight when he gives them the, 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 pro, pro, uh, the Good Samaritan story. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus sets them straight. But you won't find that in the Old Testament that it says to love your neighbors and hate your enemies. It's not there. But Jesus even takes that, that derived law, and he, he, he raises it up to a kingdom standard of righteousness when he says, I tell you, in verse 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Right? This is, again, about self-denial, but it's about agape love, which isn't an emotion, it's an act of the will. It's a choice that we make that we're going to show love to people even when they don't deserve it. See, this is found in the example of Jesus who while we were yet his enemies, Christ died for us, right? God so loved the world that he gave his, his one and only, only son. So as kingdom citizens, a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees is a righteousness that loves even those people that it's hard to love, even those people that it's not natural for us to love our enemies, and we pray for those who persecute you. And what happens when we do this? Look at, the, look at verse 5 or 45. It says, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. When we display the love of our Father, who loved even his enemies, it's proof that we are children of our Father who is in heaven. That's why, that's why Jesus says they'll know you by your love. Are you displaying it? Now, it's, it's natural to display it to those people that love you, but are you displaying it to even those people that you can't stand? Right? The, the people that make you want to turn off the TV because it's getting so frustrating. Are you able to show that same type of love towards them? When you do that, you are proving yourself to be a son of, of the Father, because he demonstrates real, genuine love. This is how he does it in verse 45 again, that you may be children of your Father in heaven because he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. See, God doesn't have to do this. We talk about storms of life, but we all need rain, right? We all need sun, especially in this culture. If you didn't have rain and sun, you didn't produce crops. And so rain and sunshine is, is seen as something God is blessing you with. And we have a God that blesses even the unrighteous.